and welcome to episode five of Tree Lady Talks. The response to our malaria, the rap, which was done by Kent Honnell in our last episode, has been absolutely global. Honestly, it's been fantastic. We had a great time doing it. We really did. I can't stop singing our malaria. There's nothing scarier. There's nothing scarier. There's nothing scarier than our malaria. It's fatal to trees. It all starts with damage to yes, the okay, flare. okay, Kent. Okay, okay, Kent, thank you. Kent, stop it. Um, and so thank you Kent for that thanks for everybody who's got in touch I really appreciated it and um, and I hope that we can manage to find some time to put the whole thing together as a track that'll be just brilliant you never know it might get covered by DJ Pimpy or something in a while it looks like some Go on, shoe string before that it's just a hidden white thing growing under the bark and just for a lark why don't you see if it glows in the dark anyway this week <laughs> bring ourselves back down to normality uh, we are going to introduce a man who was born in Nebraska in 1944. He's the author of four books. He was the honorary treasurer of the Soil Association from 1990 to 2001 and chairman from 2007. He then chaired the Soil Association Certification Limited and is now a director. And then with his wife, Josephine Fairley, he founded Green and Black's Organic Chocolate in 1991. Yum. Yum! It was the first company to have a fair trade mark. He grows most of his own vegetables organically in his pottager garden in Hastings and on his small holding nearby. And he's a co-founder and executive chairman of Carbon Gold. Good for trees. And the soil in general, there's a theme here. There's a theme, I like it. I I'm, I'm, can't wait to see the tie up between chocolate and trees. Let's get to it. Hello, this is Tree Lady Talks and I'm Sharon Durdent Hollenby. All music and production is by Noel Durdent Hollenby. And all views expressed by me or the interviewees are entirely personal. Welcome to Craig Sams. Thank you so much for joining us. Real pleasure. You've had such a illustrious career with many businesses. How did it all begin for you? My interest in health actually began when I was traveling in the Middle East and the near, well, the Near East in uh, Pakistan, India. I got very ill with hepatitis. I had medical attention, but nothing really worked, and there, the, my, the liver was not functioning properly. I got to Kabul in Afghanistan. This was when it was a peaceful, lovely place with lots of happy people. And um, went on a diet of unleavened whole wheat flatbread and unsweetened tea and cured the dysentery and the hepatitis became mm -hmm. a minor rather than a life-threatening thing. So having peered into the bowels of hell, I didn't really want to go there again. So when I went back to university for my final year, I met some people who were into the macrobiotic diet. I got into that. And apart from not going and seeing a doctor since, I've also just enjoyed really good health, um, despite the fact that they told me my liver would never recover. I then d visited a macrobiotic restaurant in New York in the East Village, Lower East Side, and decided that was what I wanted to do. Wrote to my uncle who had offered me 625 acres in Iowa to mm -hmm. run a beef feedlot and dropped out of that and came back to London where my mother lived, opened a restaurant. My brother joined me in the business. We opened the first natural food store. Uh, the restaurant was very trendy. It was like the late 60s. Uh, John, John Lennon and Yoko were regulars. And I started by doing food at something called the UFO Club, which is where the Pink Floyd got their start in London. Then we opened a shop called Ceres Grain Shop. And then other people opened shops like that. So we started wholesaling. And then once we finished packing rice and beans and that sort of thing into jars and packets, we started making peanut butter. It was called Harmony peanut butter in those days. Mm -hmm. We couldn't register the Harmony brand in various countries, Germany and Denmark, and we had a good export trade. So we switched over to the Whole Earth brand. And then in 1982, my brother created the Veggie Burger. We registered yeah. it as a trademark because nobody had ever used the words veggie and burger together like that. He went solo with that, and I kept the peanut butter and jam business. And then in 1991, 
somebody came to sell me uh, organic peanuts from Africa. They failed our aflatoxin test. I phoned him up to tell him the bad news. And he said, well, you know, they also grow organic cocoa beans. So I said, well, you know, I'd had 70% chocolate in Madrid, which was the only place in Europe where they sold that kind of chocolate. And um, I said, can you can we get a 70% chocolate? He got a little laboratory in France to make up some samples. My girlfriend, who I managed to save a few squares for, said, you've got to do this. We sat around yeah, trying to think up a name. I thought of organic chalk, bio chalk, natu chalk. She said, what about green and blacks? And so I went down to my computer and printed out a rough label and the rest is history. And I believe that you were one of the first companies or the first company to go for fair trade accreditation. Is that right? That's right. I'd already set up a deal with Maya farmers in Belize. I knew them because I'd been there, oh, five years earlier with my cousin who was making a film about the crystal skull that had been found in a ruin there. And... um, So I knew they were growing cocoa. So I rang them up and said, what's happening? They said, it's terrible. We planted all these trees. Hershey promised us $1.75 a pound, or the Peace Corps promised us $1.75 a pound. But now we're only getting 55 cents, and farmers are abandoning their plantations because it's just not worth it for that kind of money. I said, well, how much would you like to get back on stream? They said, 90 cents. I said, how about $1.25? They nearly bit my hand off. I flew out there with the Soil Association inspector and then came back. And then I met two people from the Fair Trade Foundation. And they said, why don't you go for the Fair Trade Mark? So they flew out there in January 1994, came back and said, it's everything we need and more. You've got it. And we, Sainsbury's had said they would stock the product already. We launched it at the Oxfam stand at the BBC Good Food Show in March of 1994. It was called Maya Gold. It's still there. I I remember Maya Gold. I remember that time, actually, because I've I've always been a consumer of fair trade products. And the chocolate tasted very different because in the 70s and the 80s, everything was very sickly sweet. But there was a real raising in consciousness of how people were being treated, that how their livelihoods were were really very, very poor, and it was totally unjust. So as a pioneer of that, did you find that was readily understood, or did you have to do a lot of explaining and marketing around that point? Well, we thought we would, but in fact, it took off like a rocket because the Fair Trade Foundation had been established by Oxfam, National Association of Women's Institute, Catholic Fund for overseas development, Methodist youth, world development movement, so once and Christian aid. So once the product was actually out there, all the, it was like an army of brand ambassadors who didn't just buy it for themselves. But we got a call from Tesco saying, what's this product all these vicars are calling me up about? Because obviously Christian aid were really, wanted, everybody wanted to see it happen. That they did, and it was it was a part of a movement because in the early nineties, I was very aware of that because I was involved with some organisations who are heavily marketing anything fair trade, and so there there was a, literally a hunger for it. I've noticed over the years that Green and Blacks have have greatly expanded their range of chocolate. Was that something that you did um, as part of a natural evolution of the business, or was it market led? Um, and if so, what is next? If you can possibly say if. If this was this time next week, you would be asking me because a really exciting full spectrum campaign for Green and Blacks, the first that's really happened in 15 years, is kicking off next week. This strap line is wildly, deliciously organic. Yum. We're very excited about it. And I think it reflects change in taste. I mean, I I confess I've got an 85% um, habit every day, yum, of uh, green and black chocolate. 
what what countries do the cocoa beans come from that you're involved in? Where are they growing, and what does that look like? You know, what is it, what is it like to be in a cocoa plantation? The the first time I saw a cocoa plantation was actually in 1987 when I was making this film with my cousin about the crystal skull. There was a four-day dance called the Deer Dance that the Maya do that really encapsulates their entire history. It's like their Old Testament equivalent. And I was chatting to a farmer who grew peanuts. And I said, well, do you use any chemicals? I said, no, we farm organically. We're the best farmers in the world. Well, that touched the cockles of my heart. Then he took me for a walk to visit a cocoa plantation. You know, a traditional cocoa plantation is just magical because... You've got these cocoa trees that are like house plants almost. You know, they're only 10 feet tall, if that. Um, they've got these beautiful red and yellow pods coming right out of the wood of the tree, right out of the stem, and little pink mm-hmm. blossoms. This particular one, there was a stream running through it with waterfalls, so it was even more magical than you. But you have this balance of the shade trees up above that are, you know, magnificent. In this case, you know, the plantation had been set up in 1955. So the shade Mm -hmm. trees were right up there. That evening, my girlfriend had given me a sort of notebook to keep a diary, and I'd written in it... Um, what was it called? Maya Maya. And I thought of a peanut and chocolate spread, you know, mm-hmm. whole earth was no added sugar. So I was trying to work out a way to make something using cocoa, peanut butter, and apple juice. It would be a sort of sweet type of spread. But that didn't come out in the end. But um, oh, and even then I had said uh, five cents from every jar or five pence from every jar we'd go to a rainforest establishment fund, which Belize doesn't really need because they've got some of the finest untouched virgin rainforest anywhere in Latin America or Central America. Most of the cocoa now comes from the Dominican Republic. They've been growing organically since the early 90s, but all the cocoa went to either cocoa butter or cocoa powder. And they didn't Mm -hmm. know how to ferment cocoa beans. To make chocolate, you have this fermentation process that is really activating enzymes in the cocoa bean that take away Mm -hmm. some of the bitterness and make the chocolate just more digestible. So we trained the farmers in the Dominican Republic on how to do fermentation. And now they just produce fantastic cocoa beans. And it's kind of infinitely expandable because, you know, farmers, as long as you pay the price, farmers are happy to go organic. And with carbon pricing coming down the line, it's going to be more and more expensive not to be organic. So Yes, we can talk about carbon pricing later, but it strikes me that the work you're doing is it's obviously good for the environment, but it's good for people's lives, the families farm and that's also what it's all about as well. People live too close to their farms in places like that and I mean when we were there they were still spraying DDT to combat mosquitoes that might cause malaria and one of the early things we did was support the farmers and the cocoa growers co-op in stopping the government from doing that because it's you know, they were spraying chemicals that would, were banned in Europe in the 1960s, and they were still using it in the 1990s. But how do they deal with the malaria there, then? I'm just curious. Well, you know, the, farm, the farmers say, we don't get malaria. Right, so there's some natural immunity, possibly. Natural immunity, or the mosquitoes aren't carrying it. You know, malaria is, it's not a disease of mosquitoes, it's a disease of people. And if you know, it's, it's so the 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 mosquitoes were somebody was making money killing mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes weren't really killing any people. You know, they they generally weren't that nervous about malaria. And um, moving on from green and blacks, um, although it's hard to move on from chocolate, I'm interested in your um, your interest in soil, which actually led to you with a number of important roles with the Soil Association. How did you first become aware that really everything starts with soil? I was born in Nebraska, in the the Midwest of the United States. 
I was a farm boy. When my great grandfather first plowed virgin prairie in 1885, that soil contained 100 tons of carbon per acre. By the time I was born, that was down to 10 tons. The rest would gone into the atmosphere or washed down the Missouri into the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico. So, and I saw sometimes, you know, we lived in Omaha in the uh, late 50s. And you'd drive up to the farm and you'd pass hills with these deep gullies where the soil had just washed away. I did a report in school where I had a tray of soil and I showed that if you plowed sideways, the water didn't run off as quickly as if you just had it straight down the hill. But then when I got into macrobiotics in 19, when I was 20, 21, one of the rules of macrobiotics was eat food that's grown without chemicals or preservatives or artificial additives. So I began to understand a lot more about what organic farming was. Remember, this was the late 60s, early 70s. There wasn't that much of it going on. That was really an explosion of convenience food. And a lot of people who grew up in the 70s grew up on Angel Delight and um, space dust, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it was almost going against. But there was a beginning of a movement there, wasn't there, towards wholemeal bread? I was the only child in school um, who had funny brown bread sandwiches because my mum made her own wholemeal bread every day, and it'd be going, "Eh, look at your sandwiches!" But it, there was a beginning of consciousness about it. Well, you'll like this. My daughter. Well, I had. We opened Britain's first hundred percent wholemeal organic and sourdough bakery on Portobello Road in 1972. And my daughter was born in 69, so at the time she was six. She, um, we'd send her to school with sandwiches made with bread from our bakery. And she came back after her first, her second day of school and said, I want white bread sandwiches. Yeah. And she felt so intimidated <laughs> by all the kids. So we gave her white bread sandwiches uh, you know, mother's pride. After a couple yeah. of days, she said, no, I don't want that anymore. You know, she was <laughs> happy to go back to what she was used to and uh, you know, just stood her ground. And of course, a few years later, all the mums at that school in you know, Notting Hill had gotten trendy enough to realise you know, they were all eating brown bread sandwiches and most of it from our bakery, in fact. I mean, looking back, I think it's what made me the person I am today, the fact that I stuck with the whole meal homemade sandwiches and just said, get over it. But going back to soil, carry on about your journey and how you came to be so closely associated and a pioneer amongst the Soil Association? Well, we started working with farmers. My brother would buy wheat from organic farmers who up till then didn't have a route to market. They did it because it was they were conscientious, but they would just sell it to a regular flour miller. My brother would buy the organic wheat, mill it at our warehouse, and then we'd bake it into bread. So we visited farmers. We visited uh, particularly one called Hugh Coates up near Aylesbury. And we really understood what these farmers were doing, how conscientious they were. But there were no there were no organic standards. So, you know, you could come along, people would say, oh, buy these peanuts. They're from India. Farmers there can't afford pesticides, um, which was nonsense. So my brother sat on a panel that set the, created the first organic standards and defined what you had to do to be organic. It was only two pages long. Now the organic standards are hundreds of pages because the devil is in the detail. In the late 80s, people were talking about handing over the control of the standards to the EU. And I was sort of actually objecting, saying, don't give it to them. They're in the hands of agribusiness. You know, they're victims of lobbyists. We don't want to give organic standards to them. Well, they said, well, join the Soil Association and get involved. So I stood to sit on the uh, council. I didn't get elected, but Charlotte Mitchell, who was the chair of the Soil Association, drafted me on as honorary treasurer. And the next election, I got elected with a, 
a nice majority. Um, I think people were a bit afraid because I was a bit commercial. Soil Association had always been a bit nervous about business people. We really struggled in the early days, but gradually, as the organic market grew and we had the Organic Food Awards, um, more and more larger scale farmers converted to organic and were happy with the outcome. Um, and then the dairy industry, particularly in the Southwest, really took off. And then the supermarkets really came in big time. The only supermarket that really was very supportive of organic was Safeway. Safeway had the best locations for stores in the country in terms of demographics. Anyway, they didn't succeed and Morrison's took them over and inherited, you know, a bunch of really great stores. So Waitrose and Sainsbury's leapt in where Safeway had dropped the ball. And Waitrose now is way ahead of the rest of the market in organic. Waitrose had little wobblers. They were the first to put organic in with the rest of the food. And they had these little wobblers on the shelf. So that as you were going down, you'd see this little thing wobbling up and down with the O on it. And you knew that that was an organic, if you were interested in organic. Then I became chairman in the early 2000s. And it was, again, just a really good time for the Soil Association. We we're really expanding making lots of international connections. IFOM, it's called, International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, was really taking off. And I carried on as chairman for six years and then um, handed over to my vice chair and became chairman of Soil Association Certification, which was a certification business. But UCAS, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, said I couldn't be trusted as chairman of certification because I'd been on the other side of the fence in the charity. Anyway, so I stepped down as chairman, appointed the founder of UCAS as my replacement. They couldn't complain about him. And I'm still a director of it. So I'm still, I keep my hand in there. Could you just explain what the remit is of the Soil Association? I think one can guess. But um, for those who are in Australia or Canada um, and in Europe. The founding principle was that healthy soil would produce healthy plants, which would produce healthy animals, and that the healthy food would produce healthy people and a healthy society. And that if we allowed the land to degenerate, that society would degenerate too. It, that was in 1946. In 1947, the Agriculture Act came along in Britain that said uh, subsidized chemical fertilizer for farmers and threatened to confiscate your farm if you didn't modernize by which they meant if you didn't start using chemical fertilizers and fungicides and all the rest. They never actually took away anybody's farm, but the threat was enough. So the Soil Association kind of went quiet. There were the dedicated believers throughout the 1950s and the 60s. And then when the market took off, they were, they were thrilled because you know, they weren't just doing it for nature, they were doing it for customers as well. Presumably, it's been an ever upward trend. But what does a growth curve look like? The growth curve was fine until 2007, 2008. When the financial crash happened, the adoption of organic stalled. And then it kind of started going again in 2011, 2012. And now, I hate to say this, but thanks to COVID, more people than ever before are aware of the importance of immune health and the immune system and what supports the immune system and what doesn't. And so at a, a retail level, people are buying more organic food than they ever have before, but also they're buying healthier food. Brown rice, wholemeal bread, um, organic, more vegetables as part of their diet. And so the rising awareness of the fact that your immune system is really your first line of defense. You know, it's there when you need it. And organic food and farming 
fits right in with it. The other factor is climate change. 10 years ago, if you talked about planting trees, Greenpeace would say, no, 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 that's a get out of jail free card. What we have to do is stop driving cars and stop flying in airplanes and all that sort of stuff. Greenpeace has completely changed their position now and they're incredibly supportive of tree planting. We know that trees suck carbon out of the atmosphere, but in the Paris Climate Conference in 2017, the French put forward this idea, they called it quatre pour mille, four per thousand, that if we increase soil carbon, which is organic matter, by four parts per thousand, that would be enough to completely offset our annual X increase in greenhouse gas emissions. It would neutralize it. Well, I was on an organic farm in Italy last year called La Viala. They've had the University of Siena measuring their carbon offsetting for the last 10 years. Every year, they increase the soil carbon by seven parts per thousand. So if everybody farmed like them, there would be an annual reduction in greenhouse gas levels. That's before you even plant any trees, because of course, trees are also doing something along that level, or even more in some cases. So that really brought the importance of farming to the fore. And it's going to be painful, you would think, for farmers like in my native Nebraska. Um, those guys have been happily pumping carbon into the atmosphere and degrading the soil. But my cousin in Iowa planted 160 acres of the original prairie grass mixture. And they give him $325 an acre per year to do it. And now they get all the free partridge and pheasant shooting and deer and that sort of thing that they that had disappeared from the landscape. And, and that's without carbon pricing. Once they have carbon pricing, then you know they can just tap into that market and and stop being dependent on government subsidies for corn that just ends up being turned into ethanol and mixed with gasoline, which is a terrible waste of land and food. The reason why I first got in touch or first knew about you was through Carbon Gold. Before we go into the what is biochar, how did Carbon Gold start? It started really while I was at the Soil Association. I also had Whole Earth Foods, and I launched a product called Organic Corn Flakes in 1996. And my friend Dan Morell, who founded the Carbon Neutral Company, said, hey, why don't you make your corn flakes carbon neutral? So he got Dr. Richard Tipper from Edinburgh, the Center for Climate Change, to do the complete carbon life cycle on the corn flakes. And he came back because we were then going to plant trees to offset the carbon of the cornflakes. Well, we didn't have to plant very many trees. And Dan said, well, why? Why, you know, what's wrong here? Surely there's a bigger carbon footprint than that. He said, the farms where the corn is grown, every year the increase in soil carbon offsets the transportation to the factory, the processing, the packing, the distribution, all those other costs. And that's when I realized if people had to pay for carbon, emissions and got rewarded for, even if they didn't get rewarded, that organic food would be cheaper than the other stuff. I then read a book called 1491, which described what the Americas were like before Christopher Columbus arrived in 1492. And it described the rich, lush farmland of the Amazon River that the first Spanish explorers saw. They were looting up in Peru, stealing all the Inca treasure. And a couple of them went in the boat and found this area that they described as more rich and lush than the finest pastures of Castile you know, back in Spain. But they couldn't get ashore because the farmers there were led by women who they described as having gold chains around their neck and hair down to their knees. Their boat looked like a porcupine with the arrows and spears that were in it as they made their getaway. 
And that's why the Amazon is called the Amazon, because of these powerful women who are like Amazons. It was the river of the Amazons. And he described in great detail where all these lush pastures were. About 50 or 60 years ago, farmers were competing to get this particular land they called terra preta, which means black earth. That land just gave and gave and gave. And the reason was because the Amazonians for 4,000 years had been taking all their waste, their farm waste, their domestic waste, their food waste, their animal waste, putting it into pits, covering it in clay, setting fire to it, just and making charcoal, but a very nutrient-rich charcoal. And so they've carbon dated that black earth down to, you know, 10, 12 meters, and it goes back 4,000 years. So that was the secret of why the Amazon was so productive at that time. And that was the first time I really read the word biochar. Then I started looking into it and decided the Amazon isn't the only place that needs a shot in the arm in terms of helping soil to stay vibrant and alive. And so I set up Carbon Gold to promulgate awareness about biochar and what it does. So describe to the listener what is biochar and what does it look like? Biochar is charcoal. It's not your charcoal briquettes. It's hardwood charcoal, what you might call lumpwood charcoal, that has been ground down till it's in little pieces that are only a couple of millimeters wide. Not dust, but not much, not that far away from dust. When you put it in the soil, it's, it's just little tiny black pieces. Microbes, the microbes that are beneficial in the soil, crawl into every nook and cranny because it still has cells, little holes, which were the original cell structure of the wood. And because they're tiny, the protozoa and the mites and the nematodes in the soil that would normally eat those microbes can't get in there. And so your microbial population goes up. The protozoa still get their dinner, but one protozoa needs to eat 50,000 bacteria a day to stay alive. Well, bacterium reproduces every 20 minutes. So I'll do the maths for you here. After seven and a half hours, one bacteria becomes 50,000 exponential growth. So there's still enough bacteria there to feed the protozoa because they're an important part of the food chain in the soil food web as well. But you just shift the balance in favor of the mycorrhizae and the actinomycetes that are turning phosphorus into phosphates. If there's a health problem in a tree or a plant, the mycorrhizae will take the sugar the plant is pumping into the soil and feed it to maybe the streptomyces. All of our antibiotics come from soil bacteria and streptomyces produce streptomycin, but they also produce an antibiotic that will repel a moth that might be laying its eggs in a cabbage or something like that. So that's the biological benefit of biochar. On top of that, it, it has what's called cation exchange capacity. So dissolved minerals that might wash out in the rain don't because they stick magnetically to the biochar. And so they're there when the plant needs them. Um, the porosity of the biochar keeps the soil from compacting. And compaction's a big problem. You know, if you plow, you disrupt the whole soil structure. <clears throat> Trees suffer a lot from compaction quite often. Just decompacting the soil around a tree is enough to make a big difference. So you've got that, and also biochar does water retention. So it keeps the water balance in the soil. It doesn't dry out as quickly. So when you get those benefits, you have less watering, more fertility, healthier plants, healthier soil, more aeration of the soil, the mycorrhizae make little tiny thread-like passages in the soil, but then if you're a worm or a nematode, that's a nice little highway for you to get through the soil. It just creates healthier soil. It, it's such an incredible world underneath. I've just been reading Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which really explains that so fully and, and just almost should be compulsory reading, actually, I think. Uh, it's a great book. 
for some reason, it was published in the United States back in June of last year. Yeah. And it didn't come out here until October. So I got the copy from the U.S., and I know both his parents really well. You know? Oh, right. Well, his dad was very good on morphic resonance. He wrote a book about how dogs know when their owner is coming home. And, you know, lots of examples of that where a dog is sort of up there at the window barking. And, you know, you think, what's what's going on? And then the owner's car pulls it. That really chimes with uh, Richard Louvre, the American journalist and nature writer who wrote Our Wild Calling and The Nature Principle and started Vitamin N movement as well. And it's about our connection with animals, how animals connect with each other and with us and about our species loneliness and about this resonancy and this sort of neural Wi-Fi that we have in our brain and that it is one of our senses that is often not talked about or, or dismissed by science. And that really chimes with me, actually, the fact that it's interesting that his father talked about this connection. You, you get the feeling from reading the book, and it's not why we're here, but, just, but it is related to your life's work, how everything is completely connected. And um, the habit has been to look at a series of, of processes and a series of objects, but in fact, it's all one. And you tinker one thing, it affects the other. He's in San Diego. I lived in San Diego as a five-year-old, and we had big bamboo cane breaks behind us. And as kids, we would make little tunnels and passageways through these sort of, they seemed like 10 or 15 feet high bamboo thickets. So I just dropped him a line about that and bought his book on children and woodland because we're starting, we have some woodland near here in Hastings and uh, are, are going to start hosting forest schools. I just want to talk about biochar a bit more because I think a lot of people in my industry have heard of it and think, well, okay, that sounds good. I literally have some in the back of my car. When I was going to building sites pre-COVID very regularly in um, urban areas, the soil is nearly always depleted just visually and just by smell, touch and um, appearance. You can tell that it's, it's depleted of nutrient recycling because it may have been underneath a hard surface or the area is kept very tidy although that's that's changing um, and so I would I add it if I'm doing some root work um, around an urban tree as part of a construction project it's easy to do I mean I'm listeners I'm not here this is not a sponsored episode by Carbon Gold this is my personal practice and what I have talked about publicly for a long time um, but you know, it's too. You can have too much of a good thing, can't you, Craig? It's just uh, what. What would you say with the optimum percentage of application of of biochar to a soil? 10 to fifteen percent. Um, Bjorn Embrun, who was the Stockholm tree officer, he he recommends the Stockholm method, and there are now people using it here in the UK. He just crushes rock, granite, mixes it with biochar plants the tree in it, and the trees really flourish. And they'd never suffer from compaction because it's, you know, it's these, these bits of rock. And people say, but Bjorn, what, what, why aren't you adding any soil to it? And he said, don't worry, the microbes will make the soil. And, and, they, and the, the trees are, we've got photos of some of his trees where he, before and after, he treated them with biochar. And it's just incredible, you know, because if you're a tree in a city, you've got pollution, you've got the vibration of trucks and buses, you've got the lack of light because these buildings keep blocking the sun. All these problems just, you know, are such a challenge. And he was saying that they now use his system in Malmo, in Uppsala, and the big prize for him was Gothenburg because Gothenburg looked down on Stockholm. They regard themselves as the true the true Swedes. And, and when Gothenburg adopted it, oh, and Oslo now does it too. And now Norwich has just done it. You know, it's, it's taking off. You have to think long-term, especially with trees where you have a contract of maintenance. You don't want to have to take a tree out after four years and put another one in because that's, 
you know, you're, you're getting paid once for two tree plantings. I've also used it on landfill sites which have been developed for housing where all the soil that's being brought in is, you know, British standard topsoil. And I, I'm really concerned, and I'm not a soil scientist, that this is, this is sterile. This is like giving our planted trees and vegetation a diet of bread and water, you know. It lacks uh, the life. And so we, we put a lot of biochar into the specification of that because... I'm I'm concerned. It looks good, clean, healthy soil. It's it's got the right soil structure, the right pH. Um, it's it's easy to handle. But is it truly alive? And so, actually, I I have also used earthworms as well. I think one other thing is that, you know, the mycorrhizae are the fungi that actually colonize the roots of a plant of a tree. Some of them are ectomycorrhizae, and they just cluster all around the roots. A lot of them are endomycorrhizae. They actually go in and the plant welcomes them and they milk the plant for its sugar that it's making by photosynthesis and feed it out selectively to wherever it's most needed in the soil. But the other thing they're doing is they're producing this stuff called glomalin. And the glomalin is like a sticky glue. So soil particles hold together and create, and then you can start making your little passages through it and know that they're gonna be sustainable. And then the soil can breathe, microbes and other microorganisms can move through it freely. And you have to respect the fact that there is all of this life going on. I was in Dubai, I was visiting a customer there, but the, Expo 2020, which is now going to be 2021, some of the pavilions are open, and one is called Terra. And when you go into Terra, you actually go into a world where you're walking underneath a forest. So you see this forest, and then it lifts up right in front of your eyes, and you're in the underground of the forest, and you see the tree's roots, and then you see all of the microorganisms, the mycorrhizae, the protozoa, all wiggling around. And it's, I've, I've never, you know, it's one thing to talk about the wood wide web, but this is the first time anybody has really brought it to life in that sort of a video type of format. A lot of people in our industry or, or people who care about the natural world are really beginning to have an awakening of this. The person in the street actually thinks it's kind of fun that trees communicate with each other and that there is this connection, so it's getting there. But in the daily practice of our landscape industry, that's where it really needs to get to because when I have conversations as an arboricultural consultant with a design team and a client in, let's say, a London scheme, I say, well, can we bring some worms in? Can we bring in some biochar? And they go, okay, that's weird. Um, yeah, we can do that, and generally it's okay, but they hadn't thought of it. So I think that there needs to be more education for landscape operatives, the guys and gals who are going to actually do the planting, and also for those in the landscape industry, um, so that they understand this as well, because tree people um, and foresters are going, yeah, we love this, and but actually it needs to get to the people who actually do it. And I wonder how Carbon Gold, as slick as you are at marketing, how you feel you're reaching those people. It's very, I say our biggest competitor is education. You know, if somebody's gone to university and gotten a degree and they know which combination of chemical fertilizers to use for this and which fungicide to use for that, and then you come along and say, not necessarily forget all that stuff, but look, there's another way. They, they get nervous. You know, they didn't get where they were by letting nature do all the work. So it's very much like uh, marketing organic food. You know, you could go to a farmer and say, do this, or you go to the public and, and people are, are more happy to make those choices. We're we had a, a bonanza year at Carbon Gold last year with our online sales to gardeners. 
we're really putting that messaging now on our products. I know that you as a company had a sort of a competition a year or so ago about improving the health of chosen veteran trees for important trees. And for the interest of brevity of the website, I'm just going to direct people to the blog on the Carbon Gold website. But I have had discussions, heated discussions with um, people who manage and care for ancient and veteran trees who are really concerned about this. I wonder how long biochar has been used in this way in the UK, whereby we might have some reliable case studies, or has it just been used in the last five years or so? You interviewed Tony Kirkham. The Chestnut Avenue that runs from uh, Queen Charlotte's Cottage up to the gate, that's had the biochar treatment, and it's been revived. And you can go see it from the top if you go through the walkway. There is an oak in Gloucestershire that we treated. We haven't got the royal warrant yet. If it wasn't for COVID, we would have been eligible last year. Uh, that oak has been brought back from the brink of death. Uh, there's a oak uh, that is six, 700 years old in uh, Erridge Castle that fell over. It had grown up on a tip of pan tiles and um, nobody really knew what was underneath, you know, a hundred years later, but it had a very shaky foundation. It fell over and Glyn Percival sawed off the end of the tree. So you've got this tree with its roots in the ground here, lying about five, 10 meters along, and then its branches now going up, forming the new main stem of the tree. That couldn't, that probably wouldn't have happened without biochar. I wish I could give you one example where biochar has failed, but I can't think of one. And any critics who have heated views on this should at least be able to base those views on some kind of negative experience. And I don't think they can. Air spading gets the biochar into the ground and you have to get it right down there into the root system without too much disturbance. You know, our experience is it always works. You did say to me just at the beginning of this interview that some things are never new. And you recently have been reading a book called Return to Nature. How old is that book that you've, you've been reading? It was done by a guy called Adolf Just in 1904. And he wrote in that book, man in his misguidance has powerfully interfered with nature. He has devastated the forests and thereby even changed atmospheric conditions and the climate. Some species of plants and animals have become entirely extinct through man, although they were essential in the economy of nature. So he wrote that 120 years ago, roughly. You could see that things were going badly wrong. And, you know, there are other people at that time, Native Americans and uh, other people, who saw the same thing. He spawned that whole generation of what were called Naturmensch, and when they went to America to get away from Hitler, were called Nature Boys. Jack Kerouac wrote about them. One of them, Eden Abes, wrote a song called Nature Boy that Nat King Cole recorded and it was on the billboard top 100 for eight weeks and since then massive attack david bowie everybody's copied done the song but it all came from that book by adolf just called return to nature and finally what is your dream scenario what do you hope for in the future carbon pricing it's as simple as that if we had to pay for all the carbon that we send into the atmosphere and we got paid for anything that took carbon out of the atmosphere, we wouldn't be worrying about global warming, we wouldn't be worrying about loss of biodiversity, human health would improve, uh, the world would just be a much happier and more peaceful place. Thank you so much. It's been a real education and a privilege to speak to you, Craig. It's been lovely to talk to you too.
Well, I'd like to congratulate Craig on bringing organic chocolate <laughs> into the mainstream. Putting it on general supermarket shelves, I think is a really, really important thing to have done because I walk past the organic aisle loads of times. I mean, I go back there every now and again, but I, what about you? What do you do? Well, you know, I'm an organic fan. And um, so in the days when I used to go to a supermarket, I would head there straight away. But uh, sadly, that's no longer the case, so we get it delivered. Well, you never know. There, there may come a day when biochar is available on supermarket shelves. Who knows? Who knows? But it was a very informative interview and it's very, very interesting to have spoken to somebody of, of Craig's stature. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And to see a lifelong passion in macrobiotic food, you know, the connection between that and taking care of the soil and then how you can look after a whole community by farming sustainably, not just to benefit wildlife, but the people living and working there. And then to go on to develop a natural product that is easy to use. And... I wonder whether there'll ever be a carbon tax. I don't, oh, I, I think there might be. Watch this space, we'll come back to it. Okay, so I've been told that next week's episode is a little bit bonkers, because it's about conkers and concrete. So explain, explain <laughs> that. So the title of next week's program, which is a documentary, is Conkers Not Concrete. And we're exploring the story of one tree which I worked on. It's the first podcast where I'm talking about something that I've actually personally worked on. A tree was due to be felled for development with permission and it's been saved by a combination of local people's passion, the open-mindedness of the developer and the application of science. And stand by for an alarm. I actually have a tenuous link because the site is where my elder brother found his first girlfriend. It's the Teen and Twenty Club in Tunbridge. Now, I used to live in Seven Oaks, which is not a million miles away from Tunbridge, in Kent. And, uh, and so that tenuous link, I think, is uh, deserving of a triangle. Hit the subscribe button to guarantee you don't miss an episode, and you can follow us on... Twitter, at the Tree Lady 67 Instagram, Tree Lady Talks. Facebook, Sharon Hosegood Associates. Or send an email to noel at treeladytalks.co.uk. So it's goodbye from him. And it's goodbye from me. <laughs> <laughs>